Seppi wants to uh, send her regards. She's uh, looking forward to actually coming again, maybe next Sunday, because uh, we're now going completely online. So uh, all that COVID stuff is not so much a big deal. Um, yeah, so we've had a very informative week and uh, a week of uh, exams and preparation for coming to an end of the curriculum. And uh, so it's always busy time. And students are now not sure what they're going to do because they've been told all sorts of mixed messages. Don't go home to Thanksgiving because you'll take the disease to your parents. And, you know, they're all worried. They don't know what to do. They're all mixed up about what they should be doing, you know. And uh, I think it's a really disappointing time. I think there's a lot of the lack of leadership. We've seen failures all over the show with our uh, medical people. We've found uh, out that they, they're not on our side, a lot of the medical people. They won't give us the medicine that we need. They're more interested in uh, keeping their jobs and being politically correct or whatever that means. Uh, I think there's a lot of disappointment going on at this time. We need to pray for the nation, man. We're, we're starting to see some serious cracks come open. And uh, we need to really bathe this all in prayer and, of course, be active as well. And I'd like to welcome a gentleman down the back here. I've got a visitor. You're most welcome. I hope you enjoy the message. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee today for this opportunity to meet together. And we ask, Lord, as we open the Scriptures, we'd be uh, enlivened and once again seen the relevance of our salvation and the goodness of God in our lives. We pray, Lord, for this nation as it's going through all sorts of turmoil. And we ask, Lord, that you would heal it in thy time. And we pray that we would be used of thee to help the situation. And we'd be active, Lord, and open our mouths as the opportunities arrive. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, this, you know, this seems like a strange topic, doesn't it? Herman Newtex, <laughs> you know. It's like when I was a kid and I was going to church. Now, my dad, when I started off life, I was raised in a Christian home. That my dad was what they call an open brethren. Now, you may not know what an open brethren is. Notice the word open. There is a different type of brethren Assembly is called a closed brethren. Now, the closed brethren, I mean, they are given all sorts of other names known as exclusive brethren. And the exclusive brethren, they are exactly that. They exclude you. In other words, if you don't have an invitation to come into their fellowship, you're barred. You're not welcome. And they have all sorts of strict rules and things like that. So... My dad was a member of the Open Brethren, which is exactly that. They're open, you're welcome to come, you're, and people could come. That would be similar. If you don't know much about the Brethren, they started off uh, as the Plymouth Brethren in England. And uh, if you know of Darby, Darby, he was one of them, and he wrote a lot of commentaries. Basically, mid-Acts dispensational. Okay? That's basically what they were. And how they sort of organized themselves was that they would uh, be well, equivalent, I guess, a fundamental Baptist church. That's the best I can come up with. Not the same, but about the, the sort of similar kind of thing you would imagine. Very much uh, gospel-oriented, very much about knocking on doors and, and bringing the gospel to people. And so I was raised in that kind of environment and uh, taken off to church and we used to sing all sorts of songs we'd have a sunday school and, and i used to remember all of those things and now that i'm an older person i remember those things they come back to my mind and sometimes early in the morning i forget where i am you know <laughs> i'm not losing my mind now this is just one of those things where I, i'm lost in my dreams a little bit and I go right back there, and I can hear the exact music. I mean, precisely. I hear it, just like I was there. And the faces of some of the, the people, I remember them. They come back to me. And I, sometimes when I'm uh, smelling the air early in the morning out in Oklahoma, 
it's a similar smell to the, the smell of a farm I was raised on, and I was only, what, three years of age? And my, my, my memory goes back even there, and I can even see right now, right now, I can see a, a scene which I know is true, and it's also a scene which was appropriate for my age of about three. And I can see it right now. It's, it's inside a farmhouse in a kitchen. And I was on a chair, a child's chair, and it has the, the plate thing in front. And, the, and I was here. <laughs> but I, I could see the kitchen. I could smell it. I could, they, in, in that particular farmhouse, they have a wood stove. No electricity for turning it on. Wood stove, man. Throw the wood in there and get the stove going. It would heat the place and also provide your cooking. And all of these things, they come to my mind. And at this time of Thanksgiving, we don't have a Thanksgiving in New Zealand, but uh, at this time of Thanksgiving, these kind of things, I guess, come to your mind in some way. You connect in some way to your family, your history, the goodness that's there. And I want to talk a little bit about that too in, in part of my message because this message which talks about parables, believe it or not, it gets into this kind of idea. It touches on these ideas to do with goodness, the goodness. And what we have today, I think, within the political environment is we get people who only want to talk about what's wrong with things without even looking in the mirror themselves. They want to talk about the founding generation as having all these slaves and they did this and they did that and there's you know they're rotten people etc etc and all they can do is find things that are wrong with the founders in order that they can minimize the goodness of the constitution right that's what the game is if you don't know that game by now well you, you haven't got your eyes open because that's the game the game is Pull down by using any method you can individuals that were involved with the founding of this nation. Why? So you can fundamentally destroy it. We're, that's where we're at. Believe it or not, man, that's where we're at. And as a foreigner who came into this country looking for good old-fashioned American freedom and capitalism unabashed, unashamed, and people who believed in the liberty and freedom that you can see in the Constitution, it is disheartening, man. It is disheartening. I, I, you, you must feel it too, right? You must feel it. I feel it. I feel it tremendously. And, and we need to be aware of what the fight is, and we need to get into the fray, man. It's time. It's time to get into the fray in whatever way you can. John Birch Society is a fantastic thing. Standing up for the good old Constitution. And these issues, I mean, I talked to a guy, I won't give you his name, but I talked to a guy out at Thunderbird just recently. And he pointed this out. And he was saying, you know, it comes down to the Constitution. That's all we've got in the end. Just the Constitution. And we've got to the point where, you know, we were discussing this last week, where it's possible that if we don't get quite, quite the right numbers in the Senate, that there could be the possibility that the Constitution could be in jeopardy. You know? And once that goes, my friends, do we have America? I don't think we do, really. We've got some other thing, right? We've got some other country. And we've seen this, man, around the world. People have forgotten what it means to be an American. And they've forgotten what liberty costs. It didn't come for nothing, man. Our salvation came at a cost. Now, it's given to us for free. Yeah, to us, it's come for free, but at huge cost at the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Now, I don't want to make this all about politics, because here, I want to say something straight up and down. I don't think there's any one party that's 100% right. The, we, we have to admit, the Republicans have messed up, man. They have messed up. 
Big time. They've been given opportunities and they've let them go and they, they, they fall down. You can't trust anybody in politics, man. You can't trust them. The only one you can trust is Jesus. That's it. And fundamentally, that's the problem here. You know, I was just trying to think about, well, you know, what is the real problem? Oh, they're not following the Constitution. Yeah, that's an outward thing. But the inward problem is, first of all, spiritual. You know that, don't you? It's spiritual. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever go into this thinking that as long as you can get people to vote for the Republican, that's all that matters. It doesn't. Because these people can be shifted one way or the other. What is a Republican today? Well, that's just a Democrat of yesteryear, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's basically right. Well, that's why I'm glad to be in the pulpit. I'm glad that I know at least the fundamental issue that is going on today. It's spiritual. It's always been spiritual. It's always been spiritual. And that's why I'm glad I'm a preacher, because I'm in right at the front of the fray. Okay, well, I better not carry on like this. I'm going to forget my whole sermon. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've been looking about this subject of hermeneutics, and you can see the word Hermes in there, which is the basic idea. It comes from a pagan person, all right? That's one of the gods, and his job was to communicate from the gods, and bring it down to man and then take what man says and take that back to God. And he was, he, he was, you know, very, very fast. And that's why you see all these wings on him. You know, he's very fast at what he does. And, you know, when we bring messages, we need some speed. We need to be on target as well. And sometimes what we should, should be is not so much fast, but accurate and timely. And I think this is very important. So the word is in there. Hermenuo. Okay, cool. To interpret. So last time, um, we were looking at some interesting things to do with um, this idea of the sheep coat and how that comes up in the context of John 10. Just go to John 10, just so we make some connection with last time and then move on. I just want to make some connection with it. So John chapter 10, it says this in verse 14, I am the good shepherd and, and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now I may comment about this. The sheep. Did he lay down his life only for the sheep? Well, John makes this clear that he died for the whole world. And the parables bring up the fact that he, he went and bought the whole field, and the field is the world. But anyway, go in verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, this alley, this, you see, this is a, we find it here in the Old Testament, I believe. I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep to be ruler of my people over Israel. This is talking about David. And here we have the greater David, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And it says in verse 16, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Now you say it says fold. Yeah, I know, but the word there is for flock. It should be one flock. And so in John, you've got this message of the Lord Jesus Christ in his wider ministry going out and going out to other sheep and bringing them in. Now, the Lord came in his earthly purposes to the nation of, it says, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There is the house, and the sheep coat was a part of the house. There is the courtyard. But he says, other sheep I have, which are not of this courtyard, them I must bring. You see, he's talking about the wider world. And that ministry you can find discussed even further in Matthew 22, which talks about the highways, going out to the highways and the byways and going out to good and bad and bringing them in. And finally, there will be, where are they going to bring them to? As guests. That's interesting, isn't it? Guests. See, a guest is a very, very different thing than the, the people intimately involved with the marriage, right? When you go to a marriage ceremony, what are you doing? 
Well, you might be the, br the bride, you might be the bridegroom, but as you're going as a guest, you're definitely not those. Right? If you're going as a guest, you're not, not that company. You're just sitting in there viewing as a guest. And that's the nature of this calling that you find in, in Matthew 22 in the highways. Okay, well, that's basically the sort of thing that I was talking about. And I mentioned that the word for pastor here, oh, man, <laughs> can you see that? <laughs> I don't know what went on there, but anyway, something really sad went on there. Um, the point is, it says pastors, and pastors, that word pastors is cognate with the word for sheep. And the question I'm asking is here, okay, if there are uh, apostles, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, uh, well, if there were no pastors, if there's no sheep, rather, in the age in which we find ourselves, it looks like we've got pastors with no job. You know. So the word sheep does not simply apply to Israel. So today, what are we going to do today? Well, I want to look at parables. Parabole. Parabole. Now, that comes from um, the preposition para, which means alongside, and bole comes from the verb bello, which means to throw. To throw alongside, man. Throw alongside. Now, these parables come up in your New Testament at a certain point in time, and they're very, very significant. And for our interpretation, it's extremely important we understand how they came about. Because we've got usually the complete wrong idea about the parables. And what we think of parables is, these are little baby stories for the kiddies. You know, these are little kiddie stories. These are not to be taken very seriously at all. These are for the children. Wrong. Wrong. So that's the first thing. The parables came about in a specific condition that came upon Israel because of unbelief. Now let me just show you that. If you go across to uh, Matthew, and uh, you know I'm looking at time, I'm going to try and be on time. We need to be timely. Matthew, and let me see, go back to Matthew chapter 1. And this is a good place to start because it's the first gospel mentioned here in the uh, New Testament. So we've got Matthew. Come to the New Testament. And then bang, there's Matthew. Okay, cool. And then in Matthew chapter number 1 and verse 1, it says the book. Lovely. Book. And then it says of the generation of Jesus Christ. The, look at it, son of David. The son. The first thing that's mentioned after the reference to the generation of Jesus Christ is the son of David. Do you think that happened by chance, man? I mean, he, what he could have done is he could have started with the genealogy starting from Adam and then progressing through, right? Could have done it like that. But what he did was... He starts with the son of David, then the son of Abraham, and then it goes, Abraham beget Isaac. You see, that's very strange the way that begins, because it starts with David, the son of Abraham, connects David with Abraham, and then it starts with Abraham, and then it goes forward again. Abraham beget, see? It's distinctive. Don't tell me that's not designed. It starts off... Son of David, son of Abraham, then begins with Abraham and goes forward. Weird man, unless there's teaching in here. You see what I'm saying? When you come to the Bible, you've got to keep your eyes open, man. There's something going on here with how this thing begins. Because it begins with the son of David. Son of Abraham. Wait a minute. Son of David, Solomon. What did Solomon do? Well, he took the kingdom to its largest extent. Son of Abraham. What's distinctive about the son of Abraham? Well, remember the sacrifice? Mm -hmm. So here, what you've got 
is the king. The king's domain, right? And then over here, the son of Abraham, we've got something to do with sacrifice, man. And this is something that the Jews really have a problem with. They do not want to admit that Messiah would die for their sins. Oh man, what a mistake to make. I mean, it's like the Muslims who say that, many of them say, that Jesus did not die on the cross. <laughs> you can make mistakes, man, in your life, but you don't want to make those two mistakes. Because that's serious. Because that's the whole reason why Jesus came. He came to give his life for the sheep, right? Son of Abraham, son of David. Hmm, two. Two, hmm, there's two purposes here. Well, that's kind of uh, cool. Now, if you just go across a little bit here, um, I'm going to try and, from memory, remember how this goes. Uh, have a look at Matthew 4. Yes, I think this is right. Matthew 4 and verse 17. Look at this. We're looking for structure. We're interested in interpretation. And if we get the interpretation right, we're going to be so much more confident because we build on interpretation. Now watch this. Matthew 4, 17. And by the way, have you got a King James Bible that's got a paragraph mark? Okay. Tell me, what do you notice about the next verse? Paragraph mark on the next verse? As your Bible, you don't, they don't all have them, okay? If you don't have it, no big deal. It's not a part of the uh, inspired scripture. But many of the King James Bibles will have paragraph marks. Now, there's a paragraph mark on 17 on mine, and then there's a paragraph mark right after it on verse 18. That's strange, man. <laughs> Isn't it? That's strange. One whole paragraph is just one little verse. Okay, watch. From that time, Jesus began to preach. Oh, here is a beginning. And to say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, the son of David. And here we get the beginning of a ministry. Repent. From that time. Special time, man. Special time. Okay. And look what it says. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In terms of interpretation, these things, are, these things are just remarkable. These are strong pointers in the scriptures. Watch this. Look at Matthew 16, 21. Hold your place there and look at Matthew 16, 21. Matthew 16 and verse number 21. Do you get a paragraph mark on verse 21? Look at it. Here it goes. From that time. I'm interested in times, man. Are you interested in time? Man, I am. As you can see how I began this whole message. Time. My life now, especially, I'm seeing time as being so valuable. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer son of Abraham. Right? Two time periods. One, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then later on, quite a bit on, some, a lot of water has gone under the bridge, man. A lot of water has gone under the bridge. 1621, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, look at Peter's reaction. It's interesting. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Man, isn't this Peter? We're starting to see a picture of Peter, man. <laughs> Man, he, he is, he's living dangerous, this guy, man. You're talking about God who took on flesh and Peter's coming to rebuke him. <laughs> oh, man. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, 
Be far from me, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Well, okay, there's things about Peter that's interesting. But the, the important point is that this truly is a beginning in time. Because Peter didn't know anything about it. You see that? I mean, if, if this was something the Lord had been telling them between with the verse in chapter 4 and verse 17, where he started this, this ministry, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If that was a part of that ministry, if it was a part of repent for the kingdom of his hand, how come Peter over here doesn't know anything about it? He doesn't know anything about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He said, no, it can't be. Something new began, man. Something new began. So what we have is we have uh, from that time, what do we have? We've got this uh, repent. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then later on, you have from that time. Right? Time marks. And then it, must, it goes on, he, he must suffer. And in here, that message of suffering is unknown, man. Unknown to the disciples. Isn't that wild? Okay. So that's cool to understand. Now if we go along a little bit further, I want you to see something else. Um, it, it, this, actually, if I don't watch out, I won't show you any slides. Um, let's just look at a couple of slides before I go further. First thing is, in, when you look at Matthew's Gospel, you'll find this word plerao, which means to fulfill. And what Matthew does is he says, this is what the prophets say, and it's fulfilled in what Jesus is currently doing now. This is what was said by the prophets, and now look what Jesus is doing. Can you see it's being fulfilled? Literal fulfillment going on. Put a quote here, Matthew 21, 4 and 5. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the fall of an ass. Two animals completely fulfilled, as was prophesied. Literally fulfilled. Why is this important? Because the message is about the king. That there was a promise of a coming King, the Messiah. And it's literally being fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. Literally being fulfilled. Okay, well, that's all nice. Uh, look at this. Uh, this is the one that I mentioned. Two animals in prophecy, two animals in fulfillment. Zechariah 9, nine. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the fall of an ass. Two animals, the mother and its offspring. Coming down here, Matthew 21. Tell you, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and call a colt the fall of an ass. Fulfilled. Literally, two animals done, as was prophesied. Done. The king. In other words, here we have a promise of the coming king, and it's being fulfilled. Here's another one, Isaiah 35, 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame a man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Matthew eleven four. 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John. So this is a question that John had of Jesus. Again, those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and lepers are cleansed, and the deaf here the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Oh, come on, man. Literal stuff going on. John wants to know, who is this? And what does Jesus say to his disciples? Go and tell them. Look, I'm literally here because I'm literally doing these things. These things are literally taking place. Cool, man. Now, come with me to Acts. Why is this important? Because this, this has to do with interpretation. You see, some people say, oh no, Jesus is just a spiritual guide to the lost. He's just, you know, a good man. He came with a message of love. 
You know what I'm saying? Okay? <laughs> Acts chapter number 1. The trouble is I enjoy preaching too much, you see. Acts chapter number 1. Um, so Acts chapter number 1. By the way, this man, Dave Speedy, who passed away, he was, a, he was one of these guys who just loved humor. And he would always be looking for a joke and something to bring. And he used to just love humor. And my dad was and is much the same way. The difference between he and Dave, I think, was dad always had a whole bunch of jokes written out. And he would share them with him. And uh, I can remember Dave, once he got giggling, he couldn't stop. But here's Acts chapter number 1. It says this in verse 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. So that's Luke, we believe. We, we think we've got good ground here to say that's Luke. Of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after the, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Okay, good. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, after his suffering. We touched on this. That was the second of his ministries concerning suffering. By many infallible proofs. Yeah. We talked about that too. How John wanted to know who this is. And Jesus said to the disciples, Go and tell John. The dead are raised. All the lepers are made whole. Infallible proofs. Being seen of them. How many days? Forty days, man. These people had... The teacher of the universe teaching for 40 days. 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized, baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they, they therefore were come together, they asked him. Now let's look at the question. This is, this is where it's important. They've just had 40 days instruction. Saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again, again, the kingdom to Israel? Okay. And why is that question important? Well, it seems like such a small word, but it says again, there was a kingdom. It was literal. And now, after 40 days instruction, the disciples now say, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What kind of kingdom were they looking for? It was an again kingdom, a literal one, a literal kingdom. And it says in verse 7, And he said unto them, You got it all wrong. It's a spiritual kingdom. No, it doesn't say that. It says, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father have put in his own time. What did the Lord correct in them? Was it the notion of the, the nature of the kingdom? No. Had nothing. His correction had nothing to do with their belief about the literalness of the kingdom. But rather the timing. Only the timing. It's not for you to know the time. You can't have that. They had the rest correct. Right? The, the rest was correct. It was to be a literal kingdom. So... There is to be this earthly kingdom. And when the Lord came, he did not deny that. In fact, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's close, man. All that's required for you to do is to repent of your sins. And he came to the nation of Israel to, to give this. He says this in, in, in Luke 1.32. Uh, this is the angel. Let's make sure I've got that right. Yes, it's the angel. Go back to Luke 1 with me. Have a look at Luke chapter 1. And uh, verse, let's see, uh, Luke 1 and verse 32. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so like in verse 30, it says, the, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. 
verse 32. He shall be great. This is the one that will be called Jesus. The angel tells him this. This is Gabriel. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. As we began in Matthew, right? Are you finding all the connections, friends? The connections are pretty solid. We are on solid grounds that a real kingdom is here. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then it goes on, and when you come down to verse 46, and, and Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. And various theologians will call this the Magnificat. You know, this is what Mary says about all this. And down to verse 40, 54, it says, He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And verse 55, As he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Connects directly in with the promises given to Israel. The angel said it. Mary confirms it. It's literal. It's a literal kingdom, as was promised, prophesied. Okay, cool. Well, look at the time. Have a look with me, please, as we go a little bit further into Matthew. So just go back to uh, Matthew's gospel, and I want to show you now exactly what happens as we go through as the parables come about, because this is the interesting part for this. <clears throat> Okay, so if you go across to Matthew 11 and verse 20, and have a look at this his conception. You've got the first one's Matthew 4, and then the last time was Matthew 16. So we're in between here. Okay, so look at um, uh, Matthew chapter number 11 and verse 20. It says this. It says this, um, uh, Then began he to abrade the cities, wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew eleven twenty. Because they repented not. So, he's coming... He's giving a message concerning the kingdom. He is the king. He is Messiah. And they are not repenting. Oh, that's interesting. If you go across a little bit further, look at chapter 12 and verse 6. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. 12 verse 6. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Mm, that's Jesus. He's greater than the temple. Verse 39, same chapter. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given, it, given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall... We're going to have to do a study on Jonah, right? Because there's a very interesting lineup between what happens to Jonah and what happens to Jesus. In terms of his death, I mean. And his resurrection. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You see, he's a greater than Jonah. He's greater than Jonah. If you go across to chapter 12 and verse 42, look what it says there. It says, The queen of the cell shall rise up in judgment with this generation, shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Prophet, priest, and king. They rejected him. They rejected him. Chapter 12. Interesting how the chapters are going, right? Chapter 12. Nation of Israel. Twelve tribes of Israel. Chapter 13. You got a teenaged human being in your family, have you? <laughs> Remember those days? <laughs> yeah. Chapter 13, Rebellion. And you've got some very interesting statements made. And if you come down here, um, verse 13, it says this. 
Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Hmm. There is a group of people there, the disciples, whom the Lord is going to open things up to. But to the rest, he's going to speak in parables. See in verse 10, the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto, par in, in, unto, unto them in parables? He answered and said, Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not, not given. In other words, because they were given the opportunity to repent, and from their own volition, from their own vice, they went against the Lord Jesus Christ, and so then what does he do? He uses their rebellion and hardens them in order that a greater ministry would unfold that even they themselves who rejected him could be saved. Right? That's the context of the parables. Then, of course, you've got the message of the parables themselves. But look at this. There is something here that I, I should show you. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. There's marks here, man. You need to see these marks. Verse 1. The same day Jesus went, Jesus went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. Out of the house, out of the house. Verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And then he explains to them inside the house the meaning of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Inside the house, away from the rest who were outside the house. Again, special teaching for those little flock who were the believers. Those who were rejecting him, he is going to begin this hardening process in the form of these parables. Now to see this is an eye-opener. It's a big eye-opener to the scriptures. It's an eye-opener in terms of what God is doing through Jesus Christ in terms of these two ministries. And it's not as if this has been forgotten. It's not as if the kingdom is, is all done with. But something has to be done first. Something has to be done first. And that is, there must be the matter of sin. Right? The sin must be, must be dealt with. I began with this, right? And we've got all sorts of problems in here. But you know something? Here is the point. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he de departed again into a mountain himself alone. The spiritual problem must be dealt with first before any kind of national glory and betterment can come. There must be a dealing with sin first and there must be a spiritual work in the lives of people first. And here in America, we've got the same issue. That people want to put together all of these parties and try and get their philosophy going and put it in practice into this country. But what they need first of all to do is to get spiritually right. That's the first thing. Right? Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for today for this message on hermeneutics and Lord the interpretation of scripture and all that's important there we ask that your guidance be on, on us as, as you minister to us through thy holy word and thy spirit working in our hearts and lives pray for the nation Lord that you restore it to its constitution in Christ's name we pray Amen <laughs>